Welcome back to the Iran Policy Podcast. Today, we're going to discuss the Iranian regime's nuclear program, which is becoming a growing regional and global challenge. What are the implications of the regime ramping up its enrichment activities and its continued disregard for its obligations to the International Atomic Energy Agency and the international community? Will the current path of giving the regime concessions and hoping for it to abide by international norms be successful? Are we headed for a nuclear arms race in the region? Is a military confrontation inevitable? What is the right policy toward the regime's nuclear standoff and its multi-pronged threats? Joining us to discuss this is Ambassador Robert Joseph, former U.S. Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Ambassador Joseph was involved in the dismantling of Libya's nuclear weapons program in the, in the early 2000s, and he has long studied the Iranian regime's nuclear program and its negotiations with world powers. Ambassador Joseph, nice to have you with us. Well, thank you for the invitation to join you today. So I'd like to touch base with the latest events. A recent IAEA report indicates that inspectors have found traces of 84% enriched uranium in one of the sites in Iran. What is this significance and was the international community's, com community's response proportionate? Well, I think that the finding by the IAEA that Iran has enriched uranium to 84%, which is very near what is often considered to be weapons grade level of enrichment is very significant. I think the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff called it earlier this week uh, an inflection point. Uh, Iran is at that point that it's been working toward for many years, for 20 years. And it is, uh, it is now, I think, only a political decision to uh, have a nuclear weapon. Uh, the response of the international community uh, to this latest development, I think, has been rather unfortunate and disappointing, uh, but very consistent with a long line of decisions that are very similar. Uh, what the Iranian regime has done is said that they will make uh, they will make certain concessions in terms of increasing transparency, that they will uh, pursue uh, the, uh, with the IAEA uh, the investigation uh, of the particles of HEU that have been found at undeclared sites. Uh, and I believe that they've even said once again that they will cooperate with the IAEA on the weaponization activities. We've heard all of this before, over and over and over again, uh, and uh, uh, the response, uh, the response, has, quite frankly, of the international community uh, has been disappointing, and I'm sure only provides more encouragement for Iran, for the regime, to move even further down the path toward having a nuclear weapon. And, and you mentioned near weapons grade. What is weapons grade? Is it above 84%? How much further do, do they have to go to reach that level? Well, I don't know that they have to go any further. What is, what is the conventional wisdom is that 90% is the magic level of enrichment for weapons grade. Now, if you're a and physicist and you say, well, what about 89%? Uh, you'll get, you know, you'll get, uh, you'll get different, you'll, you'll get different reactions. Okay, they could very well be at weapons grade. Iran, let's face it, is a virtual nuclear weapon state today. The notion that it will take a couple more months, which was also in the testimony, to, for Iran to have a nuclear weapon, an actual weapon, uh, is uh, is also very questionable in my in my view because they may very well have that weapon. How would we know, uh, given their history of weaponization and even more important and more revealing, given their obfuscation uh, uh, with the IAEA on that very issue, uh, we, we simply don't know. Uh, but uh, to have US uh, officials say that Iran could have enough fissile material for weapons grade fissile material for a nuclear weapon in two weeks uh, is is a major is a major deal, uh, and uh, as I say, 
of the, the response is just more of the same, uh, which, uh, you know, which, which is disappointing from a non-proliferation perspective, because this could, of course, add more fuel uh, to the likelihood of a regional uh, nuclear arms race. And you mentioned that it's more of the same, and I guess, you know, it doesn't happen overnight that they reach 84% or near weapons grade. So this has been ongoing for some time, right? And For 20 uh, years. Yeah, exactly. And I guess like the escalation has accelerated in the past few months and year, I guess. So how has it been? Uh, should we expect at some point for the UN Security Council to intervene? Or, you know, how, how do you see this going forward? Well, I wouldn't uh, hold my breath for the Security Council intervening. Uh, Iran has forged even closer relationships recently with two of the permanent members of the Security Council. And as you know, both have vetoes, uh, Russia and China. Iran is now providing Russia with drones and other materials for the Russian war against the Ukrainian people. And China has become uh, a uh, significant actor in the region. Uh, and a very important customer for the regime's oil. And neither uh, Russia or China, I think, would act to bring Iran uh, to the Security Council, to, to the Security Council uh, or, or, or even agree uh, with, a, with a resolution uh, you know, demanding that Iran step back from its nuclear activities. Um. So I guess it, it depends on the international community finding some other solution. So the IAEA director, uh, Rafael Grossi, recently traveled to Iran. And this has sort of become a routine where when there's an, uh, there's an IAEA board of governors meeting becomes imminent, he travels to Iran. And then what usually happens is that the regime gives makes some promises and then re reneges on them. So why does this cycle just repeat itself? I mean. They go there, they see some traces, they get some reports, and then the regime makes some promises and then it uh, walks back and they, they go back to the drawing board and then they do the same thing again and again. Well, I think part of the reason that you see this repetition uh, is this, this triumph of hope over experience. And that continues, I think, to define the mindset of many of those in Western governments who believe that Iran, the regime, uh, can become more moderate, who believe that uh, the regime uh, will uh, be responsive uh, to uh, the types of uh, concessions that have been offered, particularly with regard to the negotiations on the JCPOA. Uh, we have been, we, the West, we've been chasing this illusion of arms control with Iran for many years. And it's hard to, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to change the way decision makers think about this. And so you have this pattern, uh, you know, just repeating itself truly for 20 years, for two decades, since uh, the outing of the program uh, in uh, October of uh, 2002. Yes, and, and you just mentioned it's been two decades uh, since 2002. It was back then that the, the National Council of Resistance of Iran revealed the regime's secret nuclear sites in Natanz and Iraq. Uh, what did the world know before that revelation? And how, how do you see this, uh, the response that has happened and, and we've seen this escalation, this nuclear standoff escalate uh, during different governments, different administrations in Iran, whether they were reformist, hardliners, uh, centrist, moderates, and right now it's Ibrahim Raisi, who is a known human rights violator. So how has the regime's response to the, to, to the international community changed or not changed in the past two decades? Well, in terms of what what the international community knew about the Iranian program uh, in 2002, uh, before the NCRI revelations. I, I need to be careful on this point because I was working at the White House at the time. And my job was uh, to uh, 
develop strategies for dealing with the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And the focus at that time, of course, was on Iraq, and it was also on North Korea. This is the time in which North Korea's enrichment program was revealed to the world. So Iran was more in the shadows at that time. But I think the NCRI revelations had a significant impact and inspired a number of countries, including my own, to take this issue up through the IAEA and the Board of Governors. But what you find is that the process, the international process is very slow and unfortunately, in this case, very ineffective. We did, we did have, uh, you know, it, took, it took over two years, a vote of the IAEA board in 2005 that sent it to the Security Council. And at that time, we did have enough consensus in the Security Council to pass significant resolutions. Uh, that, uh, you know, that consensus no longer exists, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, that started sort of this pattern uh, of uh, ineffective responses, which has been pursued and which has been followed until today. Yeah, exactly. Um, appeasement, appeasement plays a major role in this, have, have no doubt. Yeah, appeasement and this, as you said, this illusion that somehow it's, they're going to make it work someday. So I, I wanted to talk, I wanted to ask you about how uh, the, the war, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine affects this. But before I wanted to get your opinion on uh, the, the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, in his speeches, he has explicitly mentioned Libya and said that he does not want to, he, he wants to avoid having the same fate. He, he does not want to see that repeat. And uh, given your experience in Libya's nuclear disarmament, and also you've studied uh, North Korea, how do you see, do you see any parallels or any, do you have any thoughts on the playbook that the regime supreme leader is following? Well, I do have some direct experience, particularly in the secret negotiations with the Libyans that resulted in Gaddafi agreeing to not just abandon his nuclear program, but to allow the United States and the UK to come over and take everything away. I mean, we literally took hundreds of metric tons of equipment that constituted the program and, and, and brought it back to the United States. Libya and Iran can in no way be compared. What the, what the uh, Supreme Leader has talked about and the North Korean regime has also made similar statements is that they don't want to end up like Gaddafi. And you remember that eight years after Gaddafi gave up his nuclear weapons program, he was killed in, his, in civil strife. My sense is that this is a convenient talking point that, uh, that resonates with others outside of Iran and North Korea and provides a rationale. But what it tells you, and North Korea has been very clear about their nuclear program, but what it tells you about the re regime in Tehran is that they are pursuing nuclear weapons. I mean, the logic of their statement is that you know, they need nuclear weapons in order to prevent that, to prevent that outcome. Now, the actual Libya model that was established when I was at the White House by President Bush, Bush 43, was that if you give up, if the proliferating state gives up its nuclear weapons program, it will benefit. And Libya was benefiting in that period from 2003 through the end of the, the, the Bush 43 term. It was only in the next administration in the Obama administration, and particularly uh, with Secretary of State uh, Clinton, that the US intervened in a civil conflict in Libya uh, against Gaddafi. And I think that did send a lot of negative, negative uh, uh, messages uh, in, uh, in a non-proliferation context. Uh, and it did provide the Ayatollah, and it provides the Kim dynasty 
uh, with these convenient talking points about why they must have a nuclear weapon. But I guess what it also proves is that contrary to what the regime is saying, its nuclear program is definitely not for peaceful purposes. I think that's the clear implication of what of what they're saying when they when they cite Libya. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's the logical, that's the logical interpretation. In fact, I don't think there is another interpretation. I think that's the only interpretation one can have. And all evidence supports that. And 20 years of you know, of, of building the infrastructure uh, for enrichment of fissile material for a nuclear weapon. And at each stage going higher and higher in terms of the percentage. Remember this started off at three, six, and then it went to five, and then it went to 20, and then it went to 60. And now we have indications that they've gone as high as 84. Hmm. So uh, when, when seeing this uh, nuclear standoff and, and the regime's uh, nuclear program in, in, the, in a more, how it affects more uh, the global uh, things as, as they happen globally, how does the, the, the Russian aggression invasion of Ukraine impact the, the Iranian regime's nuclear program and its standoff against the international community? Well, I think, I think that the war in Ukraine, as I mentioned earlier, has brought a closer relationship with both Russia and China. And I think that greater sort of interaction, almost to the point of an unstated alliance, uh, gives the regime in Tehran greater confidence that they can get away with what they're seeking to do in the nuclear weapons field. Uh, and I, think, uh, I think the facts bear that out, uh, both with regard to the provision of resources, uh, military equipment and military capabilities uh, in both directions with Russia uh, and the political and economic uh, relationship uh, with, uh, with China, a political relationship that we saw uh, in terms of the Saudi uh, uh, agreement uh, to reestablish diplomatic relations uh, with uh, with uh, the regime. Of course, but, and, and again, if you look at it, uh, so do you see this as uh, Russia using uh, the Iranian regime as a, as a, some sort of a lever, or is it like the other way around? So where does uh, the regime stand in this uh, triad of the, these, these three states working together? Well, I think like Russia, uh, Iran under, under the religious dictatorship is moving in the direction of becoming a vassal state for China. And I think that the Chinese will do what they've done in other similar circumstances and that is exploit the economic resources of Iran. I think that's very clear. Just like they're gonna do the same with, uh, with Russia and other countries that they've established these types of relationships. Uh, with regard to Russia, I think that, you know, in a sense, the Russia, you know, Russia has clearly become uh, more isolated because of its war on Ukraine. Uh, and the economy has suffered. Iran, I think, is becoming even more isolated than before because of its support to Russia. And look at its economy. Its economy is deterior deteriorating rapidly. Uh, and that was already from a very low sort of level of performance. Uh, the, uh, the, the economy is in free fall, as you see with the inflation rate, and the devaluation of the currency, and then so many other areas. I mean, I saw the other day that 60% of the Iranian population uh, lives below the poverty level. And this is a great country with great people. Uh, and the regime is, uh, th through its you know, support to Russia, through its relationship with China, uh, doing uh, tremendous harm uh, to, the nation's, uh, to the nation's resources, uh, and to the, the wealth uh, and the future well-being of the people of Iran.
And and you mentioned uh, the economy and the people. Uh, so so as you know, right now Iran is is in the midst of a nationwide uprising, which began in September, and this is the latest in a series of uprisings that have taken place in the past few years. People continue to come to the streets, call for regime change despite the br brutal response of the regime. So how do these ongoing protests affect the nuclear standoff and the regime's position and uh, it, it, in terms of how it's going to uh, deal with the other, uh, in the other states that are involved in the nuclear negotiations or are dealing with the nuclear issue? Well, I think that's a very important question and a very complicated question. I think on the one hand, the ultimate solution to the regime's nuclear, pro nu nuclear program and the threat that it, uh, uh, that it portends uh, is a regime change from within, a regime change driven by the people of Iran. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's one aspect of this. Another aspect is that the regime becomes more desperate because the regime understands that its number one enemy is the people, okay? The people who are the foremost victims of this regime are also their, the regime's greatest enemy, the, great, the greatest threat. And I think that drives the regime to want to uh, acquire nuclear weapons in order to ensure and this sort of relates back to, to Libya, the lessons learned from Libya. It, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it drives the regime to acquire nuclear weapons to ensure that the West doesn't come in support uh, of the opposition. So it's a complex dynamic, uh, but I think that, as I said, the only real solution uh, is regime change driven by the people of Iran. Of course, and uh, you mentioned, as you said, it's regime change uh, by the people of Iran. So you mentioned the failure of the appeasement policy and the West Western states having just reverting back to to that to the tactics of uh, giving the regime concessions, hoping for the best. And then we're seeing what's happening in between Iran and Russia and China. So tell me a bit more about. So what is the solution to prevent the most uh, active sp state sponsor of terrorism from obtaining nuclear weapons? And how can, uh, as you said, how can the, the international community support the Iranian people to right. become the, that actual solution for Iran becoming a non-nuclear state? Right. Well, as I said, regime change from within is the only solution. The regime is not going to change. The regime is going to continue its nuclear weapons program. The regime is going to continue to support terrorism literally around the world. Those, the, you know, the, the basic DNA of the regime is such that it can't really change those. So how do you get to regime change? Well, I think currently when you have the people of Iran up, you know, rising up against the dictatorship, against the brutality, against the incompetence, against their lack of basic human dignity and freedoms. We need, to, we, the West and others, need to support the aspirations of the Iranian people. And we need to support the opposition specifically. And within the opposition, I think it's very clear that we need to support the democratic opposition not the reestablishment of the Shah, not some of the other, uh, you know, other, other alternatives that uh, one sees in the field out there. What's important is to promote the vision. And this is a vision that's very clearly defined in Mrs. Rajavi's uh, 10 point plan. It's a vision for a democratic Iran, for a secular Iran, for an Iran that has equality of the sexes. And just, just think of the brutality uh, and the repression against the women of Iran, the war on women in Iran. I mean, it's, it's medieval in, 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 in many ways. Uh, and, and, and the plan also calls for a non-nuclear Iran. And I think it's that vision 
that uh, is uh, having a true effect in terms of bringing the people of Iran to the conclusion that they will never achieve their basic human dignity, their freedoms, and a democratic Iran with this regime. This regime has got to go. And I think that over the course of the last 170 some days, uh, it, it, it's very apparent that the regime will never be the same. The regime will not survive. Uh, I, I can't tell you when it's, when it's going to topple, but clearly the fractures are, are, are evident. And most evident is the demand of the people of Iran for, for freedom. Exactly. And, and as you said, I guess the, the, the ultimate solution to, to the nuclear dilemma is having a state that does not need a nu nuclear weapons. It's a free state, democratic, secular state, which is uh, represented in the 10 point plan of Mrs. Mariam Rajavi. Thank you very much for your time, Ambassador Joseph. Enjoy the talk with you. Hope to have you again on this podcast some other time. Thank you. I look forward to uh, to the next time. Very best. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone, for being with us on the Iran Policy Podcast. See you next time. Bye.